Okay, good morning, everybody. Let's get started. Um, I'm Matthew Whiting. I'm happy to be participating in the first of the WSU OSU webinar series. It's probably no surprise to you uh, that we've decided to move to this distance delivery style in this format, um, considering what's happening around the world. I hope that everybody is, uh, is safe and everybody is well. Um, we are in Washington State, very, very close to spring, very close to flowering. And so I thought it was a timely uh, topic and one that we've been investigating for many years. So I'm happy to, to go through some of the work, some of the fundamentals that we've been working on and, and um, kick off this collaborative uh, webinar series, The Fundamentals of Pollination. So for those of you who don't know me, I am with Washington State University. I am positioned at our Irrigated Agriculture Research and Extension Center. That's in the, in the Yakima Valley of South Central Washington. Um, I am a scientist, a professor, and an extension specialist. So I kind of have three roles within the university. Um, but my emphasis is in applied whole tree physiology and because I work at a research and extension center, I am in the midst of uh, the commercial production orchards and work very closely with growers uh, on many of the issues that I'll be describing to you today. In fact, uh, much of the data that we've generated over the years with regards to fruit set and pollination biology has come from collaborative work with commercial farmers. And I've been with Washington State University for almost 20 years now. I originally came from, from Canada, and, but have settled in the Northwest of the, of the United States for, for almost two decades. So here's an outline of the subjects we're gonna to touch briefly. Uh, in the interest of time, it's impossible to go into all of the various aspects and the intricacies of fruit set, pollination, flowering, but I thought what we would do, at least in this first uh, webinar, is cover some of the basics of floral anatomy, the pollination itself, what, what, what are we talking about, um, and then get into the two main components of pollination in orchards, which are concerning pollinizers. And it'll be important at that stage to review incompatibility and just discuss briefly the S alleles. Um, the second component is pollinators, and so we'll talk a little bit about pollinators and some of the issues that, that our uh, growers are facing. And then I want to finish up by looking at some strategies for optimizing pollination. You'll notice I'm not saying maximizing pollination because that would be a, a, a whole other webinar on, on what would happen if every flower on, on every tree were pollinated and fertilized. So this is the things that we're going to get into. All right, so let's begin with floral anatomy. I did indicate in the advertisement for this webinar that the emphasis would be on prunus species. Um, much of my work is, in, is specifically in sweet cherries, but I hope that those of you who are uh, growing other crops, other species will be able to benefit from some of this knowledge as well. So this, for example, is a, is a longitudinal section through a, uh, uh, could be a peach or plum or, or cherry flower. And stone fruit flowers are characterized uh, by, by several uh, definitions, one of which is that they are perfect flowers. So they're not hermaphroditic. They contain both male and female components. Stone fruit flowers are also considered perigenous, which is a botanical definition of the position of the, of the ovary in relation to the flower. Uh, which is in contrast with uh, poem fruit flowers. And stone fruit flowers will typically have single pistils. Um, there are exceptions, and, and perhaps this is a subject for a, a future webinar on multiple pistils or, or polycarpi um, in stone fruit. We've done a lot of work in that area. And they'll typically have uh, 30 or so stamens surrounding the pistil. And these are fused at the, at the upper portion of, the, of this hypanthium cup in the flowers. So the elements that we're going to get into in more emphasis and more detail include the stigmatic surface, highlighted here in red. It's connected to the base by a stylar tissue, by this red column. 
And at the base of the pistil then is the ovule, or the ov which contains two ovaries um, in a typical uh, stone fruit flower. So this is the female portion of the flower. This is the pistil as these three elements combined. The male portion of the flower is highlighted now here in blue. These are the stamens and they're comprised of two components. The anther at the terminal end of the, of the uh, filament, which is connected to the, to the hypanthium cup here. And so these are the male portions, which again, 30 to 40 of those surround a, a single uh, female pistil. So that's the, the, the fundamental floral anatomy. I wanna review at the beginning here, what I've come up with seven steps for fruit set. Um, and we'll get into each of these in a little bit more detail subsequently. But the first is pollen dehiscence. So from those anthers, the pollen is released that pollen needs to be transferred successfully. You're seeing here a, a, a slow motion video of a, of a honeybee uh, visiting a cherry flower. They're transferring that pollen. When the pollen is transferred, it has to land on a stigma that is receptive. In other words, it's functioning, it's alive. It provides a, a, an environment for pollen germination, hydration. So that's step four, pollen germination. Step five then is that the pollen tube will subsequently grow through that stylar tissue to the base. When it reaches the base of the flower, the ovule must still be viable for fertilization to occur. So these are several steps that all have to follow in sequence. And for those of you who are commercial fruit growers, I think you understand these and understand also very well how that environmental conditions can affect the success of each of these various steps. And we'll touch briefly on, on each of those in the, in the remainder of the presentation. So I'm gonna begin first by looking at these male components of the flowers. This is a scanning electron micrograph that I collected years ago of an anther at the moment of dehiscence. So this is arrow point is pointing to one of hundreds of pollen grains in one portion of that anther, right? The other side will, will subsequently dehiss as well. I was lucky to capture this uh, under, the, under the microscope. And you could take time and count how many anther, uh, uh, excuse me, pollen grains are there and there, and there are uh, uh, thousands per anther. So the key issues with respect to the anthers then are several fold. One of those is the timing of the dehiscence. Right, so when the anthers, when the flowers open and the pollen is released, it has to be at a moment that the other flowers are receptive. We'll get into that as well. Some of the areas that we're also concerned with then is the quantity of pollen per anther, per flower. Um, there's been very little work to, to better understand this. We, we generally assume that the quantity of pollen is, is in most cases excessive, though this may not always be true. We're also concerned about the viability of the pollen. I'll show you some data later where we've been uh, evaluating this specifically. Looking at the scanning electron micrograph, you can see a lot of pollen grains. We know that they're not all viable, but there's really no way of just looking at them and knowing that. So we'll show where we've been looking at this in a bit more detail. And then another component we'll get into is the compatibility of this pollen, talking specifically about S alleles. Is it compatible with our, with our main cultivar? One of the simple things growers can do to know sort of when the pollen is being available and is being released in your flowers and your trees is just by examining them. This is an apple flower that has just recently opened and you can see all of those anthers positioned here at the end of the filament, right? The two comprise the stamens, the male portions of the flowers, and they are not yet dehiscent. These are yellow, uh, sometimes with cherries are a little bit more orange, but they're, they're plump and they're full of the pollen within. So they have not yet released the pollen. Typically that will happen for a day after the flower is open. Perhaps uh, those, this, the dehiscent process will happen within a day, depending on the environmental conditions. In contrast, you can see quite clearly here what the anthers appear after they've released the pollen. They, they essentially turn inside out, exposing the pollen um, for, the, for uh, bees and other insect pollinators to collect it and, and distribute it. And you can also now see the, the stigmatic surface of the, of the five uh, uh, 
portions in a, in a palm fruit flower. So very distinct appearance between dehiscent and fresh anthers. I thought this would be a good moment to talk about pollen compatibility. Apples, cherries, uh, other species uh, in, in rosaceae family exhibit what's called a gametophytic self incompatibility. And this process is simply there to minimize selfing or self pollen by pollinating the flowers. And the long term benefits from that in, in nature would be uh, uh, outcrossing and um, and getting more uh, genetic resources. Um, so here's an example I want to walk through where I've got a, a Bing cherry pistil. Now the maternal tissue, which is comprised of the stigma, ear, the style, and the ovary, the pistil is, is, is diploid. So it contains two copies of the S allele. And Bing is S3, S4. So what I've illustrated here is if you take Bing pollen, these are these two pollen grains on this stylized stigmatic surface. So pollen from a Bing flower is haploid. So it will either be S3 or S4. And so what happens when the self pollen or the Bing pollen is transferred to a Bing flower, these S3 and S4 uh, uh, pollen grains do have the ability to hydrate and to germinate, and in fact, to begin to grow down the stylar tissue. But there is a specific sRNA reaction in the stylar tissue that terminates pollen tube growth, and that is the self incompatibility. So when pollen S alleles match the S alleles in the maternal tissue of the pistil, the growth is terminated in the stylar tissue. So S3 and S4 pollen from Bing will never fertilize a Bing flower, hence the need for, for pollinizers. And the traditional pollinizer in orchards in the Pacific Northwest of the USA has been Rainier for decades. Now Rainier pollen, when applied to the Bing uh, pistil, the Bing flower here, has S1, S4. So it shares the S4 allele, and it has a distinct allele of S1. In this situation, the Rainier S4 allele will behave similarly to the Bing S4 allele. It will not fertilize the flower. The S1, which is complementary, right? It's not redundant with the S alleles in the maternal tissue, is the allele that will germinate and successfully traverse the stylar tissue to, to fertilize the crop. In this case, uh, we're looking at black tartarian, which is sometimes used as a pollinizer. I chose it because it has two distinct S alleles, S1 and S2. So in that situation, sometimes growers here refer to this as fully compatible cross, where all of the pollen from a black tartarian tree, whether it is S1 or S2, will successfully germinate and pollinate the S3, S4. Again, because these S alleles in the pollen are distinct from the S alleles in the maternal tissue. Now there is the, uh, the exception to this rule where certain genotypes for cherries exhibit cell fertility. This is a trait that was introduced through mutation breeding years ago uh, in British Columbia, Canada. And this S4 primed allele is one that is able to grow and fertilize when there is S4 prime allele tissue in the, in the pistil. So this is an example of Sela, which is a cherry from the WSU breeding program. We could consider Lapins, probably one of the more widespread famous cell fertile cultivars, Sweetheart, Santina. These all contain the S4 prime allele. So when the S4 prime is present in the maternal tissue, the S4 prime allele is still able to grow and fertilize. Uh, and that's just illustrated in these two examples here. One important note is that while traditionally many self-fertile cultivars have been more productive than self-sterile cultivars, it is not necessarily the case. And there have been many growers who with 
planting and evaluating productivity with sulfur, some self-fertile cultivars have been disappointed in their, in their productivity. The traditional self-fertile cultivars like Lapins and Sweetheart tend to be very productive, but not necessarily so. Okay, so those are some of the fundamentals of the male side, pollen compatibility, uh, pollen viability, uh, 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 pollen uh, dehiscence from anthers. I'm going to talk about the female side, and there's two key components here. The first of which is the longevity of the ovules. And what you're looking at in the top left here is a cross-section through the ovary at the time of flowering or just prior to those flowers opening. So this of course is the mesocarp tissue that will ultimately become the fruit, the fleshy portion of the fruit. Um, the endocarp or the pit will form ultimately to surround the seed. And what you're looking at are the two ovules within the ovary. Now what happens naturally is that one of those ovules will senesce and die and one of them ends up being fertilized. That fertilization signal initiates a cascade of biological events and metabolism that leads to fruit growth and development. I think we all understand that without that fertilization signal, there would be no fruit set in new growth and development. So then the question is, how long does the ovule remain viable? Right? So the pollen has to be deposited, germinate, grow down the styler tissue to affect fertilization. And we've evaluated this using a fluorescence microscopy approach over the years. This is an example of Tiotin, which is another cherry from the Washington State University Breeding Program, and where we assessed ovule viability at 24 hour intervals. And you can see that, now this is a, this is a very different image. This is not a cross section. This is actually a, a squashed uh, ovule that you're looking at here. And this, ovule is alive. There is very little fluorescence that's just beginning to be uh, evident around the perimeter. Now you look at 48 hours later and you're seeing strong fluorescence at the base of the ovule. In contrast, 72 hours later, this ovule is fully fluorescent. That fluorescence is indicative of death or senescence of the ovule. This is another issue that we don't have time to get into today, but we've looked extensively at ovule viabilities and the environmental conditions that, that hasten senescence. What you really need to know is that warm temperatures hasten the senescence of the ovules and shorten the period that you have for fertilizing the crop. But the key issue then is how long do those ovules remain viable? So another element of the pistil then on the female portion of the flower is the stigmatic receptivity. And what you're looking at here is another scanning electron micrograph of a very high magnification of the surface of a, stig of a stigma from a cherry flower. And these are, uh, these are called uh, papillae cells and they comprise and make up the surface of the stigma, of the stigma in cherry flowers. Um, if I back out a bit, this is what the surface looks like. This is typically uh, a day before or perhaps just as a flower has opened. This is what the surface of the stigma has looked like. Got a lot of studies of the anatomy of, of, uh, of the stigmatic surface or of different genotypes to better understand differences in, in fruit set and pollination. And I'll get into those in a moment. What we do know is that surface changes. And you can see that simple contrast from, from this photo micrograph of the day that the flower opens to this stage, which is a, a day or two later. And what you're seeing here is a tremendous amount of exudate. And this is generated just at the stigmatic surface and it comes up and it coats those papillae cells with a sticky substance. And this is really critical for pollen adhesion and for pollen germination. And again, if I back out a little bit and show you the entire stigmatic surface now, you can see that those surface, those papillae cells are no longer distinguishable because they've been covered with this exudate. And now if you look closely, you can even see pollen grains 
positioned around the stigmatic surface here. These were just deposited naturally. I'd collected these samples from the field and you can get a sense for the, the size and the, and the relationships between pollen, pollen grain deposition and the stigmatic surface. So this is a surface that is very receptive to pollen. So the key issue again for the stigmatic surface is how long is it receptive? And I've included here sort of the, the punchline for the last few slides, there, there tends to be a three to four window, day window of opportunity in which we need to get pollen transferred, germinated and reaching the ovule before a couple of things happen, before the stigma is no longer receptive or before the ovule has senesced to a point that it can no longer be fertilized. So here's an example of that transition from lapins across the top this is at the full white stage. So this is actually just before the flower opens. It's really a, an amazing, I think, a, a beautiful uh, structure. You can see all those surface uh, papilla cells. And now when the flowers first open, you're beginning to see that exudate come out and, and uh, encompass those cells. And now when you look later in the season, you can see it's covered in pollen. There's, there's actually degradation of the stigmatic surface. And if I showed you the further samples, you would see a surface that is really quite barren and no longer receptive to, to pollen. So we contrasted and did an, an analysis that I'm just going to show you one photo of. Lapins versus Regina. Lapins tends to be very productive. Regina is a genotype of cherries. It tends to be chronically underproductive. And one of our questions was, are there differences in stigmatic receptivity? And the short answer is no. You, I could show you the full series of photos, but the Lapin stigmatic surface and the Regina stigmatic surface uh, were no different um, in, in appearance or their, or their receptivity over time. This is the process of degradation of the stigmatic surface and looking at scanning electron micrographs, as well as now light, um, um, light, microscope through, through vertical sections through the stigmatic surface. So you can see very healthy turgid papillae cells here and they begin to senesce and, and lice and, and deteriorate. And so that's the process from one to two to five days after opening. And as I said, what we've looked at, different genotypes that are naturally productive versus those that are not very productive, we really haven't seen differences among them in their physical structure. Could there be differences in the chemical structure in the makeup of the stigmatic exudate that would promote or inhibit pollen germination? That's possible. It's less likely, but that is an area that we haven't, haven't looked into extensively. And so what we wanted to do was look at the effect that that degradation of the stigmatic surface has on fruit set. And here's some data from a former PhD student in my lab where we put bags around the flowers at different stages and did hand pollinations. So we could control the day at which flowers received pollen. And so this student went in at one day intervals and pollinated a new population of flowers. And then we looked at fruit set at harvest. And what you're seeing here is this is, we emasculated flowers and did pollination. So this is zero. This is really the day before the flowers would have opened naturally. This day one is the day that the flower opened naturally. And then this is one day after, two days, three days, four days, and five days after the flower opened. And so you can see that fruit set was much, much higher when we did hand pollinations the day after the flowers opened. So we're seeing that the first day of, of anthesis, the stigma is not yet receptive or doesn't have maybe sufficient exudate to receive pollen or to provide an environment for pollen hydration and germination. And that tended to peak on the day after that the flower is opened. Okay, so pollination, as we go back to this uh, cross section through this stone fruit flower, and we see the components, we understand about the female uh, elements of the stigmatic surface, the styler tissue, the, the ovary and ovules, the, the male portions with the anthers releasing the pollen um, and, the, and the filament. Um, 
pollination per se, of course, is just strictly the transfer or the deposition of pollen to a stigma. I do want to make it clear that tree fruit species in the rosacea family are animal pollinated, right? So that process that, that it, I just illustrated here does not happen to any significant extent by wind. Um, it really is mediated through the through animal uh, deposition and that's insect deposition. So let's, uh, let's go back to this question of why are we concerned with that process? Why are we concerned with pollination in, in producing fruit? Well, quite clearly pollination although not pollination per se, but pollination as the first step towards fertilization is critical for determining crop quantity and fruit yield. And it's also important for determining fruit quality based on, on crop load relationships subsequently. And we've been concerned about pollination over the years in my research program from the simple fact that the process by which commercial farmers pollinate is really unchanged. Um, I'll get into this now, this pollinator and this pollinizer model process, but one in which um, we've seen very little change and we're seeing increasing stresses to that system and to the success of pollination or fertilization. So oh, pollination, uh, this is just fundamentally requires two different categories. I'm going to break it down here. The, the first of which is a source of pollen, right? So this is your pollinizer, source of pollen, and it has to be this is a very simple way to look at it. It has to be available. The pollen has to be released, dehisced from the anthers when it's needed in the other crop. It has to be compatible. We talked about that. And it has to be alive. Talk a little bit more about pollen uh, viability. This is an example of a photo uh, where the, where the uh, pollinizer and other cultivar are completely un unsynchronized. This uh, genotype uh, flowered uh, 10, 10 days prior whereas this one's at full bloom. So that obviously is not a, not a good situation. So you've got a source of pollen. And then the second component, very simply, is to transfer the pollen. I've indicated these are not wind-pollinated species, so they need animal mediation. And that has to happen, as, again, very simply, when it's needed. Talked about the receptivity of the stigma, the viability of the ovule. So you've got to get the pollen onto the stigmatic surface within that window of opportunity and you need a sufficient transfer of pollen, which is extremely vague. There has been some work looking at, for example, density of hives and how that might impact uh, pollen transfer and, and pollination success, but it needs to be uh, enough to get it done. And so these are the two elements. This is, the, this, is this pollinizer and pollinator uh, model that's used. We have plant pollinizer trees, and we introduce pollinators to transfer that pollen. So with respect to, to pollinize, um, I'm just indicating here sort of standard practices. There, I would suggest that there really nece aren't necessarily standard practices, but this is, from my experience, what I've uh, observed uh, in, in cherries, for example, or, or apples. You need to plant a compatible pollinizer. That's fairly fundamental. No, you can check with uh, nursery catalogs in order to find out which are the, wh what are the alleles and make sure that you tr uh, don't have redundant uh, S alleles in your, in your uh, pollinizers. That's probably the simplest thing to do. You've got to have bloom overlap, right? So your pollinizer has to flower. And in an ideal situation, your pollinizer would be flowering a day before the, the crop that you want to, to, to have pollinated. Um, that's because it takes a day typically for the anthers to, to release the pollen and then the subsequent one would be, would be receptive. Now the old standard in at least for cherries in the northwest has been every third tree of every third row would be planted to a pollinizer tree and that's somewhere about 10 percent density right and there are a lot of problems and challenges with that when it comes to just managing those trees or spraying those trees and even harvesting those trees it's a it's an inefficient uh, system but this is kind of the the standard old one this is a block of uh, you can see the pollinizers the crab apple pollinizers here in apple uh, there are various systems in apple this one you know maybe about every 40 or 50 feet down every every third row is a, is a similar process for, for apples. 
However, um, there are perennial concerns, and I would suggest that there are even growing uh, and accelerating concerns as regards to pollinizers. Um, poor overlap is one. So this Bing Rainier block was classic for, uh, for Washington in the Northwest here, um, Rainier pollinizers. And I have seen in the last few years where there is no overlap between Bing and Rainier. And I think this is due to more increasingly variable spring weather. Um, this is shifting and, and different genotypes are reacting to that in different ways and, you're, and it's inducing uh, asynchrony or separation of those uh, uh, flowering times. And that's just meant that there is less pollen available in that orchard um, than there was when there is good overlap. I get a lot of questions about the density and distribution of pollinizers. How many should I have and how should I plant them out in the orchard? I indicated the old system was every third tree, every third row. So I've sort of indicated that here with these yellow circles, those are the pollinizers in a couple of rows. At the end of the day, growers with lower yields than expected are sometimes left wondering, is that enough pollen in my block? Or I didn't have a good overlap, we had the problem. So we've seen in more recent years, growers planting solid rows. And this has the advantage of, of management and certainly for harvest, that it'd be far simpler to lay out bins and harvest entire rows. And so if you planted a solid row as every third row, now you would have a 33% pollen density, you'd have a lot more pollen available and simpler to manage. In many situations, that's not reasonable. It would depend on, on your cultivar mix and harvest timings and many other issues, but we're seeing a shift away from every third tree, every third row. We're even seeing, as I've illustrated here in the bottom, these red lines, double rows now, where you might have two rows of a pollinizer and then perhaps three or four rows of a main cultivar alternating with two more rows some growers are adopting this approach, again, for the simplicity of management. Two, two things this accomplishes, gets a lot more pollen into the orchard, and then it allows you to lay out bins down the middle and pick the two rows into one. So for harvest, it's a, it's a far uh, more efficient process. I'm gonna show you some data shortly here that indicates there's variable performance of pollinizers. In other words, that the quality of the pollen can vary from year to year. And then the last one is compatibility, concerns over compatibility. This one is the easiest one. This one is, is uh, easy to, to avoid. Any challenges there? So I want to show you some data with regards to the variability in pollinizer performance. This is a, a picture of a, a recent graduate student in my lab, Katie Taylor. And she was, uh, her project, we were looking at, at 10 or 11 different cultivars sweet cherries, all from our research farm, and looking at their uh, pollen viability from year to year. So what I'm showing you now is our fairly recent data from 2019 and the range in pollen viability. So collecting flowers from the field from the same location, bringing them into the lab, and then looking at pollen viability on germination media. The average was about 50%. Um, but it ranged from Chelan having almost 70% viable pollen to Ulster having just over 10% viable pollen. And you can see the range in between here. So what we're seeing now is that depending on the pollinizer genotype that you choose, there can be nearly a seven-fold range in pollen viability. Now what I'm showing you here is a difference between pollen viability for the same cultivar, but between years. So here I'm showing you that between 2018 and 2019, uh, most of these cultivars had higher germination, but uh, Chelan actually had lower germination. So this is showing you that, for example, Van had 15% higher germination in 2018 than 2019. It's showing you that Sweetheart was fairly stable. It really didn't change much. Bing didn't change much. Sila didn't change much. Chelan was the exception that it was the opposite trend as the others. So it was higher when the others were lower. So what we're seeing here is that 
your pollinizer trees planted in place in your orchard are going to flower every year, but you can't see these differences in pollen viability. And it could be, we've seen up to 20% difference. So that means without yours noticing anything different, perhaps the overlap is good, perhaps the, the flowering density is good, but in those anthers, as the pollen is released, there's a 20% less viability in one year versus another. Um, and this might make, a, might make a difference. We're continuing to study this uh, over multiple years rather than just the two years. So with, with respect to pollinizers then, just a few tips. It's important to know the alleles. This is fairly straightforward. And you want to use what we call fully compatible cultivars. And that is, you want to have S alleles in your um, pollinizer trees that are, com that are not present in the main crop. That's, that, that's the easiest one to accomplish. Knowing bloom time. That sounds fairly straightforward, but that's actually quite complicated. We know that uh, relationships among genotypes and their flowering time change from different regions to different regions. And so one of the best things to do is talk to your neighbors and, and find out someone that's perhaps close to you who has that cultivar and say, oh, you know, when is black pearl flowering in relation to Chelan? How about early robin? When is the flowering time in this area um, to get a better feel? Because just because a nursery catalog suggests that there's good overlap, it doesn't always hold true in your, in your region, your area. We're seeing a shift to higher proportions of pollinizers rather than the old 10% every third tree, every third row. We're going to solid rows. Um, and I think this is a benefit because we really don't want to be in a situation of feeling like there was not enough pollen and that's why the yield was low. And considering multiple pollinizers is, a, is another approach. So rather than a single pollinizer genotype, planting multiple ones. This really comes down to how reasonable that is for you and managing a block and managing an orchard if you can, if you can do that. That would cover your, your bases and a little bit more resilience perhaps if you have a few days difference in your flowering times then you can uh, perhaps have some resilience to, 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 to shifting at bloom times. Okay, let's take a look at that other side of the story then. This is the pollinators. Uh, you can see Apis mellifera, the European uh, Italian honeybee, um, introduced species to North America, uh, visiting a, a cherry flower in this photo that I caught a few years ago. You can see it's got the, the uh, pollen uh, stored here on the, on the rear legs. And if we zoomed in further, you would see that these fine hairs typically are covered with pollen as well. So what's the standard practice here? As before, we're introduced uh, by renting honeybee hives and dispersing those around the orchard or throughout the orchard in some cases, at least around the, around the perimeter. Um, and it's not more standardized than that. I get a lot of questions about how many, and where, and, and is more better. Um, and so this is, this is one of the challenges that I think that growers face um, year to year on the second part of getting that pollen that's there in the pollinizers, getting it physically transferred um, to, the, uh, to the other flowers. And so there are perennial concerns regarding pollinators too, and it is related to density and distribution. We've seen an increase in hives per acre among tree fruit growers in the Pacific Northwest from one to two hives per acre. Now four to five is becoming more common simply because growers do not want to be looking at a light crop at harvest and then wondering if it was because of insufficient pollinators. There is an increase in cost for these hives um, and this is due in, in large part to the colony collapse disorder, which is, a, which is a global phenomenon. And so as there are fewer hives, they do become more expensive. Um, we also know that pollinators uh, distribute pollen-borne viruses. So they will collect pollen from a, from a cherry tree that perhaps has Prunus necrotic ring spot virus or prune dwarf virus, and they transfer that to the neighboring trees. And in addition to that, there's growers deal with variable performance. So four hives per acre one year is not necessarily going to give you the same performance and foraging ability as four hives per acre the next year. 
I'm not a beekeeper. You should talk to your beekeeper and find out ways to assess and standardize uh, colony performance uh, to try and minimize that variability year to year. So in summary, what I'm suggesting to you when we look at this pollinizer and pollinator model is this, what I call pollinating power is gonna vary every year based on viability of pollen in your pollinizer trees and based on performance uh, of, of, of pollinators in the blocks. And this is what you depend your, 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 your year, your productivity on. And I think it's subject to a tremendous amount of, of biological variability. And then we've seen this over the years. I just I want to summarize the, the, I want to summarize in the next series of slides, the variability in fruit set that we've documented in just different experiments. This one is just different cultivar and rootstock combinations. And it's fruit set as a percent of available flowers. And you can see it ranges from less than 20 with Rainier. Uh, one this year we had Bing was on uh, fruit set. But a tremendous range, tremendous variability uh, among these cultivars and rootstocks. Here's an example of the variability for one cultivar in one year in four different commercial orchards. Chelan was 5% fruit set in an orchard close to our research farm here and 10 times higher in an orchard just about an hour from our research center here. What were the differences between these blocks? They were both Chelan, they had differences in pollinizers and different pollinizer patterns as well, but they both had about four and a half hives per acre. But a tremendous range here. We can look at it even in more detail. So I showed you cultivars, now within a cultivar, and now I'm showing you within a tree. These are some of the data that we generate when we look at individual branches. This again is Schlan. In 2018, of 40 different branch samples that we assessed fruit set, the average was 45%, but it ranged from almost 85% to less than 10%. So a tremendous range even within a tree. And the last one I want to show you is variability in fruit set from day to day to day. So this was a tremendous amount of work that we did years ago, uh, actually in Australia, uh, characterizing daily fruit set uh, with sweetheart, uh, attica, or cordia, and, and lapins. And you can just see the range of sometimes almost 90% and, and sometimes down to 20%. So the main point that I'm making here is that there's a tremendous amount of variability. And I think that a lot of that comes back to this pollinizer pollinator model that we use for fertilizing uh, crops. It is a system that is just naturally fraught with variability and quite sensitive to environmental perturbations. So I wanna finish by talking talking about a couple of areas that we've been looking at to try to address this and try to minimize some of this variability. One of which is a concept that is not new, but we've been calling it a precision pollination system. And this system is comprised of, of three different stages. The first is to have previously collected pollen and Depending on where you live, there are uh, probably existing pollen companies that, that do this already. This is a photo of collected flowers from which the pollen will be harvested and then sold. The second step that we feel is important is to suspend this pollen in liquid. And this is a picture actually of the, of the, of the inside of a spray tank with our pollen in suspension under, under, under agitation. And the third component then is to apply the pollen with a sprayer. So our work has been utilizing uh, electrostatic spray systems and we feel and have shown that this is important for a couple of reasons. The most important of which is that that, that small stigmatic surface on each flower has quite a strong negative charge. And when we, when we apply pollen in suspension in fine droplets, that are positively charged, we're using the uh, electrical laws to attract those droplets to the stigmatic surface. And I do want to acknowledge uh, support for this research from, from Furman Pollen, they're a company in, in Washington State, and on target spray systems who have uh, 
uh, helped us in, in, in uh, providing sprayers for us to test out this, uh, this work. They're a, an electrostatic spray company in, in, in Mount Angel, Oregon. And this, is, this photo is an example of our experimental setup. I'll show you a few data slides, but this is what it looks like. So we would load up our pollen suspension in the tank and spray it out at various stages of flowering to try and increase uh, pollination rates. And very briefly, I'll show you some of our more recent data here. Um, this is a, a Chelan orchard where we had 25% natural fruit set. We had high variability among individual branches here from zero to 100%. But when we applied 20 grams of pollen per acre, two applications, we had a significant increase in fruit set and yield. In another orchard of Chelan, it had naturally just about 50% fruit set. Again, a lot of variability among individual branches. But again, when we applied 20 grams per acre, we had significantly higher fruit set. In a Benton orchard, now Benton, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a self-fertile cultivar that tends to be not very productive. And so we did a trial in there and we had naturally 50% fruit set, but we increased fruit set significantly when we had a treatment of 40 grams of pollen per acre. Skeena also is self-fertile, and again, we saw increases in fruit set with supplemental pollination treatments. And I haven't seen the results yet of a trial that was set up in, with, uh, in Chile with, with Regina, um, but we've been having some collaboration with uh, cooperators in Chile to, to understand the uh, effects and the potentials for artificial or supplemental pollination in, in the Southern Hemisphere as well. So I'm, I didn't want to show you a lot of data uh, in this presentation because it can become, become too much. But here's an example of the numbers that I just showed you uh, in Benton from this past season. We had treatments of 20 grams of pollen per acre, 40 grams of pollen per acre, and then an untreated control. So in the untreated situation, they had four, uh, they had four hives per acre and, pollen, and Benton is a self-fertile cultivar, so they had an abundance of pollen. And you can see statistically here, we were increasing fruit set by 3% or by 13% with the higher rate. Similarly, uh, we sampled, uh, in this case, uh, nearly 100 branches you know, of these different treatments, again in Chelan, and we saw a 5% uh, increase in fruit set from 20 grams per acre of supplemental pollination treatments here in this past season. Just talk to you about a little bit about these applications. What I just showed you were data from supplemental pollination treatments. So we're going into commercial orchards that are already uh, trying to maximize uh, fruit set by having pollinizers and pollinators. And so every time we would make a pass with this supplemental pollination treatment, you have to think about the population of flowers that could be influenced by that treatment. First of which are the open flowers. So if a flower is closed when we went past, clearly any additional pollination treatment will be ineffective. Secondly, of the flowers that are open, as we've just talked about, not all of them will be receptive to pollen. Some of them may have just opened and, and as I showed you not receptive or open for four or five days and no longer receptive. So there's a, a population, a, a smaller population of flowers that will be receptive. And the third element is that they would be flowers that are not yet visited by pollinators, right? So pollinators are present in all these orchards. So our ability to increase fruit set from supplemental pollination depends on those three conditions. And so maybe, for example, it's a very limited population of flowers, like perhaps just those three, for example. What we have a vision for in the future, and this is a bit longer term, but it's something that we're calling replacement pollination. In fact, the, the vision that I have here is in future orchard systems, we would be utilizing precision pollination for consistent and balanced cropping. And to be clear, the vision is one in which orchards would no longer have pollinizers and would no longer use pollinators so that you could directly pollinate the crop with artificial systems and control those processes and be less sensitive to uh, environmental uh, 
conditions and all the other pressures that, that, that um, are exerted upon the traditional pollinizer pollinator model. Now, I want to finish with one other concept. We know that sometimes the availability or the distribution of pollen is not limiting to fruit set. And in that case, supplemental pollination won't do anything to increase fruit set. In that case, we're more concerned about ovule viability. And this is again some of my previous students' work where we characterized the senescence or the progression of the death of ovules from completely alive to completely, completely dead for those two ovules. And one of our questions was, does ovule viability limit fruit set rather than pollen application? And this is one example of a low yielding cultivar compared with a high yielding cultivar and our assessments of ovule viability in the days after flower opening. And you can see quite clearly here, high yielding cultivars maintained ovule viability five to six days after opening the flowers. So that's a much wider window of opportunity to set the fruit. This low yielding cultivar began with less viability and the viability declined quite rapidly. So that by five or six days, there was very little uh, of the ovules that remained viable. And clearly that would have an impact on fruit set. And so our early, early days work on this was to try to extend the viability of those, of those senescent ovules. And we did the first work uh, util utilizing AVG. Um, it's amino ethoxy vinyl glycine. It's marketed under several trade names. In, in this area, it's called um, Retain. And we utilized treatments of Retain at various rates. Um, this is one pouch per acre. It's a standard at 333 grams. And in this case, you can see that our untreated control was about 15-16% uh, fruit set. And when we had our highest rates of retain, uh, we had about a 50% increase in fruit set from that, from that treatment. I don't have time to show you all of the results in our work here. We've looked at timing of these applications, rates of applications, but we've seen that in cultivars where rapid ovule senescence limits fruit set, this is a treatment that can be effective. Um, and here is just uh, one more example of Regina, one of these cultivars that experiences rapid ovule senescence, and we were able to increase a fruit set with various treatments of retain um, at different stages of popcorn or 10% or full bloom um, and different rates. So our recommendations, just to summarize what was really several years of, of work, is that if you apply this product at about 10 to 75% bloom, it can be effective. I believe this is the maximum labeled rate. I would suggest that. We have found that really only a single application was effective and that it's especially important during warm flowering time. Okay, so that concludes the seminar, the, the, the slide set. Um, uh, I hope to impress upon you some of the fundamentals of pollination and fruit set, the key components. Uh, some of the, quickly we've talked about environmental effects. We talked about pollinizers, pollinators, issues you can, you're facing and ways to try to overcome some of those issues. My email address is here. I'm happy to, uh, to accept uh, email questions subsequently. We have a Facebook page, which is WCU Stone Fruit Physiology. We post periodically research updates there. Um, I want to thank, uh, uh, Bernadita and Ashley for helping to coordinate this first of the webinar series and I'm happy to stick around and answer questions um, if there are any more questions. But I thank you each of you for joining us um, and look forward to connecting in future webinars.